Hello everyone, welcome to Member Summit, Spot the Scams and How to Protect Yourself. My name is Elissa Parker. I am an internal fraud investigator here at BECU. Alongside, we have... Uh, my name is Robert Tursky and I'm a financial crimes investigator here as well at BECU. And let's go ahead and dive right into it, starting with our agenda. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about trending scams. We're gonna talk about what to do if you do end up finding yourself in a scam how to avoid scams or how to not be a victim, and how to report fraud. First up, we do have a quiz today. So right below, there will be a poll box for you to be able to answer um, with what you think is the best answer to this question. So which age group saw the biggest increase in reported romance scams in 2021? We have 18 to 29, 30 to 49, 50 to 69, and then 70 plus. So again, there is a poll box just below. Go ahead and submit your answers, and we will come back to this in just a couple slides. And that quiz should be live. So like Alyssa said, it should be underneath the video. Uh, please feel free to participate. It is really fun to see if you were right. Uh, so let's start with trending scams. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is an account takeover. Uh, so account takeover fraud is a particular kind of fraud that involves uh, usually multiple points of contact or multiple um, exposures to a bad actor or to a fraudster. Uh, you would start with receiving a phone call or a text message or an email. Uh, they may ask you to verify information. They may ask for a PII, which is personal information, essentially. Uh, and their goal is to use that information to then conduct a kind of attack, a takeover, per se. Um, I'll actually give a little bit of an example. I was working with someone just today who, in his case, uh, he was coerced into opening a BECU account by somebody on the phone. Uh, he lived up in, not up, down in uh, Michigan. It, he lived over in Michigan, let's put it that way. Um, and he was coerced into opening a um, BECU account by a stranger on the internet. Uh, who then kept bugging him and kept saying, okay, did you do it? Did you do it? All right, now tell me your username and password. What username and password did you use? And they they lied to him. They told them that they would be depositing $3,500. More on that later, because that's actually a bit of a job scam as well. But uh, they told them that they would put in that money and then had him share all his information. And then they took over the account. That is to say that they had the access to the online banking. They had access to the card. They had access to his personal information to verify. So it was a complete takeover. Um, so this is a particular kind of scam which uh, usually starts with an access point to your accounts, uh, which is a nice moment to talk a little bit about two-factor authentication, which two-factor authentication is something that you may be familiar with. Uh, if all of you have your cell phone, if you use your phone to log into something, or if you log in somewhere and it says, please um, enter in your, I'm sorry, please enter in the code that you received on your phone, or please click yes on your Google login. That is a two-factor authentication system, and it's designed to make sure that you are the person logging into your accounts. Account takeover fraud, uh, or fraudsters who work in this particular medium, that is one of their golden eggs. They will try to get you to share that verification information with them, or try to get you to click yes, because it's very hard to bypass that kind of security otherwise. Uh, so let's move on to our next type of example here. Oops. Okay. There we Sorry go. About that. <laughs> All right, that's okay. <laughs> so now we have recruiting scams. Um, recruiting scams are primarily popular with teens. However, the scam does not discriminate. Um, it goes towards anyone who will fall for it, unfortunately. So this scam is where people will either ask you where you bank or ask you to deposit a check at your financial institution on their behalf, and then ultimately deposit a large check, like let's say $500, and they'll say, you can keep $100 of that check, but we want the 400. And then that check will return on your account and you are left with the negative balance from that. So this check is super popular, especially with social media. It, they can target you at sporting events, at the mall, at the bus stop. Instagram, Snapchat, wherever wherever they can get in contact with you, they will target you. It's super important with this type of scam that you never accept a check on someone's behalf, um, never allow someone access to your online banking or your debit card to deposit the check. 
um, and never provide the information. You know, you never want to take it for someone or allow someone to have access to that information to do it themselves. So the next slide is actually an example of a recruiting scam. So this is specifically on Instagram. We have this lovely, this lovely member actually interacted with this scammer. Luckily, they did not fall for it, but they did provide us the image so that we had it to share. So as you can see, they dive right in. The scammer contacts you and says, hey, how are you doing? I saw that you um, follow BECU. Do you bank there? And then immediately goes into, hey, I know this sounds real weird, but I'm very serious. I need you to do me a favor since you bank with BECU. I'm willing to give you $1,000 if you do this for me. So the next slide will show that this person requested them to deposit a $10,000 check. And they could keep 1,000 of it, but they just need to send 9,000 on their behalf because they didn't have access to their financial institution. This will leave you in a very bad place. This is a perfect example of what you should not do and why you should never interact with anyone who's contacting you, asking you to deposit on their behalf. Because ultimately, you will be stuck with that $9,000 negative balance if the check returns. So, go to the next slide. And by the way, quick shameless plug, if you do have any questions about any of the scams or any examples you want to give or anything, you know, we do have a chat box down below. Uh, we don't have too much time for questions during this presentation, uh, but we will try to get to all of them. Uh, and if not, then we do have a panel afterwards where we'll be answering more questions. Um, so next scam we're going to talk about is a sweetheart scam, also known as a dating scam. Um, and this one gets a lot of traction. There's actually TV shows about it. Uh, all the concepts of, you know, catfishing as well kind of applies to this general topic. Um, but a sweetheart scam is a kind of scam which specifically targets people who are emotionally vulnerable in some sort of way. Um, so that can make it a very difficult uh, fraud type to work against. Um, because what the fraudster will do is, more often than not, they'll convince their victim that they are actually in love, that they are uh, either in love or very emotionally intimate can sometimes take other forms, but it's usually love. Um, and uh, they will, you know, it will be days, weeks, months, or even years. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, I've worked with somebody who is completely convinced that she is secretly dating, I think it was David Hasselhoff, and that David Hasselhoff can't talk about their relationship publicly. And, you know, it's funny, but it's also, the thing is, it's, it's real. It's real in her mind. And so what these sponsors will do is that they will uh, manipulate that emotional relationship uh, into either some kind of account takeover or some kind of recruitment scam. You'll notice that all these scams sort of work enmeshed with each other. But their goal is to then get you to trust them so that, that they can manipulate you into doing something worse or giving up information uh, or providing access to your funds. One of the big indications of a sweetheart scam, one of the biggest clues, because people ask me all the time on this, um, is uh, that a sweetheart scammer will never meet in person. Sweetheart scammers are almost always, I should say almost always, uh, virtual. Uh, they'll always have some sort of excuse for why they can't meet, or they'll have some issue with plane tickets, or they need to get a divorce first, or they need to do all these sorts of things. Um, and that's always just a convenient excuse not to be in person because their goal is to manipulate you. Their goal is coercion. Um, so this is an incredibly important scam to talk about uh, because this is one that we can all protect our family and friends from. Uh, you know, people like Alyssa and I, we can't really make a huge dent on people who have fallen for these kind of scams because who are you going to listen to? Your fiance or some banker on the phone? Um, so this is one in particular that we do really want to educate and talk about. And that's it on that one. Yeah, these ones are always the most heartbreaking for me. Mm -hmm. They are the worst. All right, so now we will be joined by Debbie before switching to the next slide. Um, she is going to provide us with the answer from the poll. So hello, Debbie. Hello. <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting one. Um, so 45% of the people who the, um, answered the poll so the majority of the people at this poll said that they think it's the people between the ages of 50 and 69. Okay. That's actually, yeah, you know, that's good. a very, very understandable. I think, you know, Robert and I do see a lot of romance fraud within that age range. However, 
the most popular is now 18 to 29. And the reason for that is uh, dating apps. Truthfully, dating apps are everywhere. They are social media now, right? And so 18 to 29 is really seeing the spike with romance scams because of how much access people online have to everyone else online. Do you have anything to add to that, Robert? Do you feel like you see anything specific within that age range? Uh, you know, it's 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 kind of shocking because I, I if you had asked me this before I worked in financial crimes, I would have also said, you know, either 70 plus or 50 to 69. Um, but the reality is, uh, if you take a look, even if you just take a look at dating apps these days, they're covered in suspect people. And if you're wondering what the goal is of these obviously fake profiles, uh, there you go. It's usually just fraudsters, either fraudsters or people collecting personal information. So it's one of those things that you can really just see with your own eyes, which is kind of shocking. I would imagine it's also that the person um, doing this has access to kind of things you might be doing online that kind of they can they can they're getting very good at it. So they can they can, mm -hmm. they can start building a relationship based on things that you are posting and you don't realize it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we post everything from what we eat to what we changed into that morning to where we walk our dogs. I mean, we post everything, right? And so they have all of those topics to be able to bring up and have conversations with you about. So thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. All right. So next we are going to discuss employment scams. Um, employment scams have definitely been on the rise with COVID and having access to other social media sites such as LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and other places that you can look for jobs online. Um, employers will place ads online that are very enticing. Um, the job will seem way too good to be true. We have a mm -hmm. saying in financial crimes, if it seems too good to be true, it is. We cannot scream it louder. <laughs> it is. You have to trust your gut with this. So the ad online will appear very enticing. It'll make you want to click on it because it will say things like a remote job from the start. We have a sign on bonus. Um, we will send you money to purchase your equipment, things of that nature. The other thing is a lot of these jobs will offer you the job on the site on site, you know, without any um, interview or anything like that. I actually uh, had someone admit to me that she interviewed for a job via text message. Please don't ever do that. <laughs> if a job is ever asking you to interview via text or, um, you know, like email, anything like that, anything that's not in person or face to face, maybe on like a verified Zoom call, I would avoid it. Um, and the other thing is legitimate employers won't ask you to deposit and then send money back upon hiring. A legitimate job, if they are going to be providing you with equipment for the job that you are going to be working remote, they will send it to you on their own dime. You will never have to deposit a check and then send money via Venmo or Cash mm -hmm. App or any of those um, you know, third party transferring services in order to purchase equipment prior to starting the job. Um, I strongly suggest anytime that you do apply for a job, look into what you're applying for. Um, Google, check to see if there's any reviews that say that there's a possible scam related to it. Call the HR department to verify that you have an interview with the specific person at that location. Definitely do your research before moving forward with accepting anything from the job, but know that you will never have to deposit anything prior to doing work for that company. Yeah, one thing. One thing we uh, when we discuss these these kind of, when we discuss employment scams of teenagers, one thing I always mention is that jobs are supposed to be boring, at least when it comes to the pay portion of it. Uh, the job itself can be exciting, 
but most jobs pay you every week or two weeks on Friday. Like th this is what you should be expecting. So if I anything changes the money, yeah, if anything changes the money, it's something to look out it's for. It's supposed to be boring. It's supposed to be boring, yeah. <laughs> you're not supposed to be getting your paycheck in like three different deposits and you're supposed to, you know, get gift cards with one of them and send them back. For no, that's not how that works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so loan scams, the next one we're going to talk about. Um, and this one is fun because at first guess you might say, well, what's that? Unless you're really savvy, in which case you know exactly what that is. Uh, but for most of you, if you think about what you have in your mailbox, odds are you've probably recently gotten a loan scam in the mail. They're actually quite common. Some are legitimate, uh, well, legitimate shark lenders. Um, some of those are just straight up spam fraud. Um, and so what a loan scam is, a loan scam is when a fraudster or a bad actor group uh, pretend to be a legitimate lender of some kind, uh, offering you a something that you can't miss. You know, remember what Alyssa said? Uh, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. No one's giving you a $10,000 loan with no credit check. It's not happening. I wish. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, typically these deals are too good to miss. Uh, and the thing about a loan application, if for those of you who've applied for a loan, which I'm guessing is most of us, uh, when you apply for a loan, you're not just giving your name and phone number and stuff. You're giving your social security, your date of birth, your spouse's name, your spouse's information, your employment information, your annual income, every address you've lived at, where your money's been for the last few years. You're offering an obscene amount of information, which if you remember back to our first slide about account takeovers, your personal information is almost as valuable to a fraudster as any money you have. They can use that information, even if you don't have money in your account, they can use that information to get money out of you. Um, so be very careful for these kind of lend, le lenders. Uh, when you are applying for a loan of some kind, or when you are looking to do a large financial purchase of any kind, even if it's not a loan, even if it's a vehicle through eBay or something like that, uh, make sure to validate the person you're buying from. Make sure to validate the organization. If it's a lender, make sure that it is an established lender that you can easily see information about. You know, I would rather that you borrowed from, from a bank than borrowed from somebody who sent you a letter in the mail uh, saying, hey, do you want a loan? Um, and so, yeah, just be thoughtful about the information that you share when applying for such things because that information can be weaponized and used against you. All right, so next up we have ATM skimming, and this is another one that uh, really just grinds my gears, steals your hard-earned money, um, and it's, it's the worst because it's hidden and you don't know until it's too late. So ATM skimming is when a device is placed on either an ATM specifically or a gas station pump. Um, another example I like to give is unfortunately online, sometimes purchasing online, your information can be stolen in that way as well. Um, but specifically, we have the pictures here to show you what skimming devices can look like. So as you can see, it can be a pin pad. It can also be a card reader. And then this last one is just a wire within a gas station pump. So skimming devices are used um, to basically steal your card information and then be able to withdraw, to create a new card and withdraw funds from the ATM utilizing the information that was input. So super important when you are at an ATM. You know, you don't need to be afraid of every ATM you walk up to, of course, but definitely be leery of ones that still utilize the mag strip as opposed to the chip reader on your card. Um, another thing to look at is try to jiggle the card reader that you see there. Those green ones, if they're on there, they will, they'll jiggle. You'll be able to tell. Try to lift up the keypad just to check if you don't see anything probably okay. Another thing is at the gas station pump, if you ever notice there's that long strip of tape and that shows that a gas station pump was serviced and reviewed and there isn't anything in there. Um, so if you ever see that that's been tampered with, I would not use that pump. I would notify the gas station attendant and then use a different pump. The other thing is when you are at the gas station pump, don't use your PIN number when you're purchasing gas. Hit the credit option on your card and type in your zip code. That is another way to protect your information because remember at an ATM, they still need your PIN number to withdraw the funds. So super important to remember that.
uh, family emergency scams. Uh, let's see here, is it gonna pop that? No, okay. So uh, family emergency scams or grandparent scams as we typically call them um, are another type of scam that you may at first not really recognize what I'm talking about, but the moment I tell you what to think about, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've gotten that. Uh, so these are usually come through the phone um, and they sound something like this. Hey, this is the IRS. You owe us $3,000. Otherwise, we're going to have the police outside your home unrest you right now, right? Uh, so I'm sure we've all heard those before. <laughs> um, but they are kind of a wider class of scam, which we refer to as a grandparent scam, although it can target anyone. And the goal here is to use a little bit of information that the bad actor has gleaned about you already to target you with a kind of a, a extremely well-targeted thrust, per se. Uh, and so I'll give you an example of that. If, if a, um, imagine like a spear. Um, <laughs> uh, imagine if you had on your Facebook, on your social media, uh, that you have a daughter uh, who is going to school in Cambridge. Um, and obviously you don't live near there. You live in Washington state. Um, that could be all the information a fraudster needs, if, well, and your phone number to call you and say, hi, I'm, insert name of your daughter here i am having or or hi i'm representing your daughter's name here uh your daughter's in trouble and we need money immediately to get her out of trouble right and so of course one of your first reactions will be well oh my goodness i have to go save them immediately um which is actually something that happened to a close friend of mine um a close friend of mine well we're we're polish and so are they and um, somebody pretending to be his grandmother, sorry, somebody pretending to be him contacted his grandmother saying that he was arrested in the US jail system uh, and that they were going to execute him unless she immediately paid ransom. Uh, which, you know, being in her late 80s, of course she was like, well, I have to go grab my wallet and transfer all this wealth that I have. Uh, and so this is a, re a very real scam which targets quite a few people. Uh, and one of the themes of this scam that I like to talk about is the sense of urgency, because that's what this is. This is a scam that invokes urgency. Um, and so when you are when you're teaching yourself and your friends how to avoid this particular scam, uh, put a flag in your mind that whenever someone or something is making you for any reason act urgently with your money, whether it's an immediate funds transfer or immediately have to withdraw money or immediately have to send money, the moment you get that sense of urgency related to money, you should stop and validate, stop and verify. And this is a theme, you, you'll hear this theme across all of our scams, but these things are verifiable. If somebody's calling to pretend to be, our, be the IRS, which spoiler, the IRS is not that easy to work with. They don't call you. They'll just add your taxes. I, I Apparently I underpaid my previous taxes about $8 and they told me during this year's taxes that I owed $8. So that... <laughs> They know they're just not going to bother to tell you. They'll make you deal with it. Um, and if it's your grandson or if it's your granddaughter, um, you should be able to call them. You should always be able to communicate with them. Uh, these things are verifiable. So if something is making you act urgently, always, always, always stop and verify it. It's like stop, drop, and roll, but stop right. and verify instead. Stop, drop, and call. Call, stop, drop, call and someone call. else who can verify. <laughs> I love that. And call your financial institution. I mean, we we are more than happy to speak with you about these at any moment. I we can tell you from experience that these are scare tactics, and you do not have to follow through with them. We will point you in the right right direction of who to contact to verify what you're being told. Mm -hmm. Oh, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna add one more thing to this slide just because I don't think we mentioned it later on. Um, but another thing I wanted to mention is um, IT scams. Uh, they look quite similar to grandparent scams, and that's. Uh, but we're we're seeing a rise of those recently, which it's a pop up on your computer that sounds very similar to these things. Usually, it'll be uh, your computer is in danger; it has viruses, or it will be uh, your accounts in danger, things like that. Um, same thing. This is something you can verify. If your computer really has viruses, your antivirus software should be able to verify that without some third party program telling you that. Anyways, let's move on. Perfect. All right. So, what happens now? Right? What do we do if we are a victim or if we suspect that fraud could occur? We first don't be ashamed. 
<laughs> that is our number one biggest thing that we would like to say. Do not be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Fraud and scams happen. Um, we are here to discuss and communicate how to avoid those in the future. We are also here to help you prevent those things from happening. So never be ashamed if you are a victim. Um, just take it as a learning lesson and definitely call your financial institution to learn how to prevent it from happening further or in the future. Um, scammers use this to their advantage and scams are becoming more sophisticated. We have to mm -hmm. remember that this is a scammer's job to scam, right? So they adapt to whatever the new technology or surrounding is and they will find a way. We are here to help you uh, have the knowledge to protect yourself. And then also remember that you could be responsible for paying those funds back, right? I mean, unfortunately, if you do participate in the activity and you allow someone to utilize your card or you send money on someone's behalf, you are ultimately responsible for the funds that were utilized. So you could be responsible for paying the funds back. Um, your credit could also be impacted by accounts that get charged off. If you leave your account in a negative standing for too long and it, it gets sent to collections, unfortunately, that is a ding on your credit. Um, and then the last thing is you will be reported to check systems, which will impact opening accounts at other financial institutions. This is a way for other financial institutions to communicate with each other if negative activity has occurred. Um, so super important to stay in good standing with your financial institution. All right, and then the five things to remember, never let anyone borrow your debit card, never give out your PIN number over the phone, in person, online, to anyone, anywhere, at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Never give out your online banking information. I like to compare the username and password for your online banking to your license. You can't really hand your license over to just anybody. You definitely want to keep your username and password um, to yourself as well. And then never cash or deposit a check for anyone and never open accounts for anyone but yourself. Super important to not open accounts under false pretenses for someone else thinking that you're going to be getting money from them. Um, you always want to keep your accounts to you to protect your balance. And if there is one of those that you remember, if it's one of them, please at least at the very least remember this, the fourth one, never cash deposit a check for anyone. Just don't do that. <laughs> we see a lot of that. Um, another piece of advice that we have for you uh, is recommending checking your credit reports. Uh, one of the few things that was good that came out of the pandemic, I don't know, can I say that? One of the, one of the few good things that came out of the pandemic was that um, the annualcreditreport.com, which is a government service for providing your credit card report, uh, now allows you to receive your credit report, I believe it's uh, either every week or every two weeks, as opposed to once a year. Um, so this is an excellent service, and I highly recommend, you know, if you're on a computer, open up another tab, go to annualcreditreport.com, sign up for that. This will help you keep tabs on your account, especially in the case of possible ID theft. That's not something we talked about too much today, but ID theft is something which, uh, if it is happening, if somebody is using your personal information that they stole to open up accounts at other institutions, your credit report will help you monitor for that and keep it safe. And now how to report fraud. So if you have the, wait, I'm so sorry. That was right. <laughs> that was right, okay. <laughs> if you've been scammed. <laughs> sorry, I'm used to another slide being there. Uh, if you've been scammed, uh, notify BECU immediately. Uh, it is important that we know. We will help you provide the right steps, no, tell you what to do, and most importantly, We've been there, we've seen it, whether it's us or whether it's the contact center team or whether it's the people at the branches. Um, they've seen it before and they'll see it again. They will be able to help calm you down and talk you through what happened. Um, so that's an incredibly important step. Next thing is to file a police report. Uh, the next thing is to file a complete complaint with the Federal Trade Commission at FTC.gov. Um, these are two steps that will really help us when we are working on an investigation. Uh, this will allow us to potentially share information about the investigation with law enforcement, if appropriate. Uh, if you think that the scammer has your social security number, contact the Social Security Administration fraud hotline uh, and let them know. And that can help you get through the next few steps of dealing with potential ID theft or social security number theft. Okay, and then, oh. <laughs> Last, we do have resources, well, 
uh, actually not last, I apologize, but now we have resources. Um, so first up there, of course, is going to be BECU.org. You're welcome to visit BECU.org at any time. We have wonderful articles and resources and ways to contact BECU um, to discuss fraudulent activity if you need to. The Better Business Bureau, Federal Trade Commission, and then Internet Crime Complaint Center are all there as well. Those are wonderful resources if you are a victim of fraud. And then I know we are cutting it very short. We do have time for questions. If anyone would like to submit some questions below, um, Robert and I will also be in the next uh, fraud panel. So you will be able to submit questions if you are sticking around for the fraud panel as well. Um, but we do have a couple minutes. Okay. I do see a question that just popped in, which is what is a code word and why should I have one? Love this question. A code word is a password for your account and why you should have one is because it is a way to protect your account from anyone calling or coming in pretending to be you. So a code word is something that BECU offers as a password for your account. You can make it anything that you would like it to be. If you want it to be a made up word, it is your choice, my friend, because it is your <laughs> password. And BECU will only ever ask you for this information if you call or come in to visit. It is never something that you should provide to anyone. It's never something that we would request from you if contacting you. It is only ever something that you would have to provide if you call or come into BECU. It is another channel of defense against fraudsters calling or coming in pretending to be you. I highly recommend that everyone establish a code word. It's just it's just extra layer of security. Like ultimately that's when it's said and done. It's the best layer of security you could possibly have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh. I think oh, go ahead. I did see another question. Did you see another question pop up? I do, I yes. I see uh, <laughs> what should I do if I think my family member is falling for a romance scam? Uh, that's that's a tough situation. I'm sorry to hear that if that is the case. But uh if you do think that someone you know is falling for a romance scam, uh, there's a couple things you can do. From a from a financial crime standpoint, one of the most important things to do is to not let it drop. Keep bringing it up. Keep pointing out the issues with the relationship. You know, keep pointing out, hey, um, have you met her yet? Have you? Do you know who this person is? Uh, things like that. Uh, keep asking and and. Ask probing questions to make sure that finances aren't getting involved. If finances are getting involved, uh, you may even consider contacting BECU uh, or if they, uh, contacting their financial institution on their behalf. Um, another thing as well is, and this is less financial crimes related and more so personal, um, it may be important to spend more time with that person. Um, these fraudsters latch onto emotional vulnerability. Uh, and so if somebody is falling that hard for something which is so obviously fake, uh, one of the best things you can do is just be there with them, be there for them and, and talk to them a bit. That will really help them kind of break out of that echo chamber of this person dragging them down. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, if, if they are a bit more reasonable, uh, you can also just point out the blatant issues, point out, hey, are they asking you to send money without meeting you? That's kind of weird. I don't know about that. Uh, and for the younger folks, because funny you'd see about that poll, I was thinking about older folks, but about your friends, about colleagues, um, the same thing applies. Ask those probing questions. Ask them, hey, uh, did you meet this person? Hey, isn't it weird that they said they would do this thing and it didn't happen? Um, so ask those probing questions, uh, especially with online dating these days. Uh, hopefully people are talking about their experiences with their friends and so you're able to kind of look out for each other a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I do see another question here. Is money recoverable if we fall victim to a scam? Um, that is an amazing question. And the best way to answer that is BECU will always attempt to recover funds if and when we can. Um, there is never a time where we will not try at least to get the money back. Now, the circumstances of the scam uh, can determine, unfortunately, if you do get money back. Um, it's So that's really hard to say. We'd have to look at the case, right, and see exactly what happened, um, if you communicated with the scammer, or if the funds were stolen from you. But the best way to answer that is BECU will always attempt 
to get in contact with your money and get it back into your account. And Rebecca, the same does go uh, if you are abroad. Um, if you are abroad and scammed, you know, those steps still apply, although they might be a little bit more convoluted, but the first step is still definitely to contact BECU. Uh, we'll do our best to recover the funds if possible, and we'll guide you along the right steps to take. Absolutely. Let's see, do we have any other questions? I don't think oh, anyone. I see a Oh, go ahead. A couple up here. Go ahead. Do, do you see one? <laughs> oh, I was actually just going to ask you, what is the difference between phishing, vishing, smishing, and all those names? I keep seeing them, and I never, it always confuse me. Yeah, so phishing is typically a call or text. Um, vishing, I believe, is email. I think, it, yeah. Oh, my gosh, you're putting so. me on the spot. Basically, it is when someone <laughs> is contacting you via a fraudulent channel. So that could be via text message um, from or a phone call from a spoofed number. It could mm -hmm. also be from an email that's pretending to be a company, like, for example, Comcast or, uh, you know, Tacoma Power or something like that. Um, those are channels that, that fraudsters will use to attempt to contact you and appear as they are a company or a legitimate source um, so that you respond either with your personal information or by sending money. Uh, there are a lot of clues within text messages or emails and things of that nature that you can look for, though. Uh, you know, for example, I, we have seen one, unfortunately, go around with BECU, and it will say things like BECU.com or BECU Bank. Well, BECU is a credit union, so we're never going to say BECU Bank because our name is Boeing Employees Credit Union. It's spelled out BECU. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we are BECU.org. So we go by .org, not .com. So those are things that you can look for within texts or emails or even phone calls that you get when, when people are referring to themselves as, hi, this is BECU Bank's fraud department. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's Boeing Employees Credit Union, financial crimes, those things. So. Yeah. And when in doubt, remember, you can always verify things. If yeah. one of us, if one of us is calling you, we do not mind if you say, "Hey, I'm a hang up. Call the one eight hundred number and get rerouted to us." That's great. I don't mind. I've never minded. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, we may not have been able to answer everyone's questions, but you are able to email community relations at becu.org if you have additional questions. We will also be in the next panel if you would like to join us, and you can submit all your questions there for us to answer. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great night. Take care.